That is our church assessment, a church survey. Um, 40 of you responded to the church survey, and uh, that was uh, excellent. We were very pleased to get 40 responses. You know, the typical thing when you send out a survey is you get about 15%, 20% response if you live in New Zealand. If you live in America at the moment, you do a little better, I think, but uh, New Zealand, you're lucky to get 15 or 20%, or well, we got away better than that, because out of about the 60 or so eligible to respond, um, we got 40 responses. I'm going to ask the deacons if they will pass out to you a little uh, sheet, two or three sheets of paper there with the results of the survey. You'll recall that there were, you might not recall, there were 60 questions on the survey, 60 uh, propositions that you could respond to, positively or negatively, or you could be in between. And uh, so I'm just going to give you an idea of how this has gone. I'm grateful today for Nigel, who spent a good deal of time entering this into the computer system and uh, getting the, uh, the results up for us. Thanks, Nigel, for that. And uh, <coughs> you have them now in a written form. We thought just to put them on the screen, but that doesn't seem to be... Uh, uh, quite right, because uh, you need to take this home and look it over, but perhaps I should explain what it all means a little bit first. <clears throat> there were three sections in our survey. One section was ministry effectiveness. That's the things that the church does uh, regularly on a sort of ministry basis. There's the evangelism readiness aspect of the survey. And then there's the visitor receptiveness part of the survey. Hence, as you look through there, you will see three graphs, some of them more filled out with colour than others. And with these uh, surveys, uh, of course, we are dealing with the opinions of the church folk, how you see it. And when we put them all together and collate all the responses, we get a score as to uh, how the church sees it. Now, of course, Brother A over here, he might see that, uh, he sh that, uh, that we should get uh, a top three, um, absolutely positive, and get a, a three for that. But uh, Sister D over here, she might think, no, that's, uh, that's not right. I see it the other way. It's a minus three and it goes way down to the other end of the scale. But when you put them all together and spread them, uh, see them spread out and, and then you put them all together, you get an average of how the church folk see things. So let me just give you a rough idea as you look at your sheet and you can follow it on the screen if you want to. And the first one has to do with ministry effectiveness. And uh, you will see the first bar on our graph there is to do with Sabbath school. Sabbath school. How did the church folk like Sabbath school? How did they see it? There were a number of questions about Sabbath school there, four questions about Sabbath school. And uh, <coughs> on the scoring, they averaged it out at five. They reckon we got five out of six uh, for Sabbath school. So uh, it looks as though the church sees Sabbath school as being uh, very effective and is doing a good job. The next one you see there is worship, and uh, <coughs> that scored four. Now, <coughs> you'll notice that uh, on the left-hand column of figures there, underneath or adjacent to these different departments, you will see... On the left-hand column, say Sabbath school's got 1.8, then 1.81, 1.31, 1.25. And you might think to yourself, now that sounds terribly low. But remember, that is above the centre line, above the centre line. So if you marked on the centre line when you did your thing there, it meant that you were, um, you were not in disagreement and you were not really in agreement with the statement. But if you go to 1.89 score or 1.81 score or 2 score, means that you are well on the way towards agreeing with it. And uh, if you saw a 3 score, and I didn't see anywhere that we scored a total 3 on anything, 
But if you saw a three score, you'd say everybody who filled in the survey was totally in agreement with that statement or with that part segment of the church uh, work there. So anywhere that you go one and beyond, it indicates that we, as a church, uh, see that it's working, it's functional, and so on. Where we get up near the twos, well, it's going pretty good. So uh, worship there, we scored a four, and uh, <coughs> a four seems as though the church is pretty happy with that. In prayer, we scored fairly well there, scored... Uh, a three on there, but just look down there in your sheet. It's the third one down. There's prayer meetings and small groups. Um, there was a couple of negative... Uh, there was one negative figure in there. The bottom one said, I have a friend in the church that I consider my prayer partner. And we got minus 0.27. Well, that's less than minus one. It means that uh, you can't totally agree uh, that, that as a church you can't totally agree um, with that statement as a church. Now, some of you, of course, would have marked that you do have, but as on the whole, it looks as though we can't totally agree with that, so uh, it looks as though that's an area we might have to do some work on if you think the prayer part of ministry is important. Church social life, we didn't get any negatives down there under those average scores, and we got a score for four, uh, as far as the graph is concerned, which indicates that the church generally sees that the social side of the church is going fairly well. And then uh, discipleship and uh, how we get along with uh, <coughs> discipling, making people uh, welcome into the, into the church and actually involving people in the church, growing them in the church, we didn't get any negatives down there, but they weren't too high either because you'll notice a couple of them just got a 0.29 and a 0.49. Well, that's, uh, that's not too high a score. And uh, so we might want to look at that. But we scored a three for a discipleship on the graph. This graph is to make some sort of comparison as to how the church sees themselves. Well, the next section is on evangelism readiness. And you'll notice that there's only two bars showing up on that graph there. So that must tell you something. It doesn't mean that it's all bad. It just means that there are some areas here that are not all good either. So uh, evangelistic activity and the results. Well, we didn't get any average negatives down there. We got a score of two. So the church people are seeing that uh, there is some results there, but look under that average unit total, that uh, first column there, just in from the right-hand side on the screen, and you'll see there's some fairly low scores there, 0 0.47, 0 0.41, 0 0.03, that's getting quite low. The, the church's evangelistic efforts are successful. So most of you thought, well, yeah, they yeah, we can just say that there's some success there. That's really what this is telling you. You agree that it is uh, somewhat successful, but you're not strongly agreeing with that statement at all. So this might be something we could work on. Now I'll just draw your attention to something else. The right-hand column of figures, uh, near the right-hand side of the screen there, um, tells you how many people responded to each question. And so under evangelistic activity, 37 people responded to the first statement, 36 the second, 34 the third, and 34 the fourth. So six people who responded in the whole survey didn't respond to those questions at all. So uh, you'll understand what that right-hand column is. It's interesting as we went through this that we didn't get 40 people who responded to every question on any one sheet. So everybody somewhere left out uh, a response. Either they didn't understand it or uh, they thought it was irrelevant or something. So just for your interest's sake, that'll show you how many people responded. On the average, I think around about 37 people responded in each um, questionnaire, each uh, <coughs> uh, assessment survey but not everybody answered every question on every sheet 
just for your interest, a community seminars and events offered by the church. Well, we, uh, we got a score of one there. That means you agree that uh, the church is working in that area, but it's not too fantastic, is it? A uh, score of one, would have been lovely to see a three there because three would be the top marks, but one means there's work being done, but it's not the greatest. Bible study is conducted by members. Now, <clears throat> look down there on that average unit total, the second column in, and you will see some figures there that uh, are not terribly bright. Minus 0.78, 0.53, minus 0.94, and 0.51 and on the average we are we are below the line which means that most people disagree that we're doing well there doesn't mean that they very very strongly disagree but those figures tell us that they disagree that those statements are true for this church number of positive contacts that the church has in the community and uh, likewise there's uh, not a terrible good uh, response here. <coughs> um, did I jump over a few? I think I did, yeah. Bible studies conducted by the members. Evangelism training for church members. Yeah, that's another one. Um, likewise, it's, uh, it's below the, the naught line there, the middle line. And uh, so we're not uh, seeing ourselves as being terribly good in that. Um, let's go to the bottom one, the number of positive contacts that the church has in the community. Again, you saw yourselves as not being too bright in having a lot of positive contacts in the community. Um, the figure is not the worst it could be, but it's not really showing us that we think that we have a lot of contacts out there in the community. Now, this would be true, if I can just explain for a second or two, this would be true of Seventh-day Adventists and many other church organisations that have been established for quite a while. Because what happens? The church circle becomes your circle of friends. The church uh, that you attend and, and the fellowship that you are involved in becomes mainly your circle of friends and social activity. And uh, if there's a kids' party, it's 10 to 1 that the kids from the church come to it. And if you're turning 90 or, or 100, as will be next year, um, nine times out of ten, it'll be the church folk that come uh, to it and so on. Um, your friends are less uh, outside of the church circles than they are inside of them. So uh, that's an area we might need to look at and becomes quite personal, actually, because the church can't dictate to anybody or even make some sort of rule that you make a lot of friends out there. We have to do that personally. Lastly, let's look at the visitor receptiveness. How do we think visitors uh, fare when they come to our church? We've only got two bars in our graph there. Two bars. <coughs> but uh, let's see how you think we fare. Visitor attendance. We didn't think that visitor attendance was very high. We're below the line on that. Visitor training for members. Training members um, how to handle visitors. Did anybody train you how to entertain at home? Um, perhaps mum showed you the things that you should do when visitors come. We had rules in our house that when visitors came, we had to do certain things. One was we had to make sure that all the cats were out of the house and stayed out of the house. And the other one, we had to ensure that the dogs were tied up because uh, dogs, especially young ones, chew up the visitors' shoes. And uh, so we had some of those visitor rules, but uh, are we following them for the church? Well, visitor training for members. We didn't score very good there. There's a couple of minuses there. There's a couple of positives. And one good thing is our church goes out of its way to ensure that those visiting have a positive experience, and we at least scored one there. So, uh, so that's good that... Uh, <coughs> They, uh, they feel that that's the case. Now, of course, just because we feel it, does that mean to say that it's real? Just because we feel it, is it real? Sometimes we can be a little self-deluded. So we need to think about these things a bit and see whether or not we really think that they are real. Visitors' awareness in the services of the church 
<coughs> there's those statements there that we agreed or disagreed with. It seems as though that we agreed pretty much with the first statement, but there's a couple there that we're pretty much on the edge about. And uh, the last statement, the church has a plan that provides for the children of those visiting. We almost scraped in with a one on that one, but it didn't score on the graph. So uh, um, it, uh, it would have been uh, better perhaps uh, if we could have scored a little higher on there. However, um, I know that the church provides a Sabbath school and, and a lot of good things for the kids and the social things going on and so on, but this was your perception. So, uh, number of members inviting friends to church? Well, that looks a little better, doesn't it? And uh, people are doing some of that. We are seen like that, and uh, we score a two on our graph for that, so that's a little better. And finally, the churches visit a follow-up program, and... Uh, the worst score that we got in the whole thing was on this one. Visitors usually receive a thank you card from the church a few days after visiting. And uh, we scored minus 1.56. And uh, that's halfway down the side where it says I disagree. And uh, that's probably a pretty fair score uh, there. But there's another minus there. Then there's a couple of positives. And... Uh, <coughs> It didn't, however, give us anything on the graph. Did you have a question on this? Yeah, I'm trying to at least think about what you're saying with the numbers. Right. Uh, you said under the average units total, the range was from 0 to 3. Yeah. Under average units total, probably. It goes from minus, minus 3 yeah, minus to 0 three. is the middle line, then it goes to plus 3. Fifty percent. Uh, yeah, you could say fifty percent is okay. is uh, zero, or fifty percent is is virtually a non-answer. Put it that way. Um, you neither agree nor disagree. You're sort of in the middle of the line. Okay. If you. Yeah, they added the average unit total is added, making allowance, of course, that if you got a minus, you must subtract that from the the pluses. You add the average unit total, and that should show up on your graph as, uh, as a, a positive, or the negatives are not actually shown on the graph. They just don't go below the line. So the you will find a little bit of variation there. Sometimes they don't seem to add. I checked through them. One or two of them don't add exactly. No, they're um, round numbers. So they're, they're, the average unit total never comes They're... Uh, this, uh, this whole thing, of course, is not meant to be um, an absolute uh, statistical paper. Um, as you can see, it's done for practical purposes to give us a uh, fair idea of where we're going. Of the yes. Yeah, it does. If there's a very low response, like in the last... Uh, the churches visit a follow-up program. The very last one there on that page, I think it is, um, you'll notice the responses were 32, 32, 36, 36. Just before that was 31. People are getting pretty tired filling it out, I think. And uh, so they, uh, they didn't fill out all the answers and we only end up with 31 sheets. I hope that helps a bit. Um, look it over. I hope this has explained it somewhat. Remember that nothing is totally bad, but nothing is as good as it could be either. But this is your perception of how the church is. What's going to happen to it? Well, the church board's going to look at this, and uh, we're going to see, and we're, we're happy to have your input into it, talk to anybody on the board and say, w you think that we should brush up on this aspect. It might be on visitors, or it might be on children's care or something. You tell the board members if you think we ought to work on that area, let us know, and uh, we'll look at it. Now, we're probably not going to jump in and say, oh, we're going to straighten all these things up straight away. We're going to have everything perfect straight away. No, that's, uh, that's too much to do in one instant. The board would probably say there are three things here that we can immediately uh, look at improving and improving our score. This survey is, uh, is really as a result of... Uh, 
what has proven to be the success areas in a successful church. Successful churches, churches that run a good program, that are attractive to the community, that uh, are building up the spirituality of the church membership, um, they have these basic things here in place and working well. And uh, so that's how the survey is, uh, what the survey is developed from. Could spend a lot of time on it, you'll hear more about it. And uh, I just wanted you to know, we wanted you to know as a church board that uh, your survey uh, time was not wasted. It'll be valuable to the church and we want to see something good develop out of it. Well, uh, sorry visitors, uh, today we're spending a little bit of time on the local things of the church, but uh, <coughs> that's uh, how it's coincided today. I thought we'd talk for a few minutes about the church. The only model church. There's all sorts of churches that have taken all kinds of models, all kinds of things, play, uh, um, ideas for a model. Uh, uh, a, uh, an idea of, of how they can formulate a church. And if you're talking about religions, of course, you're talking about um, religions that uh, have based their philosophy, all with the exception <coughs> of Christianity, upon a person, a human being. You can go to Islam, for instance, and, uh, and Muhammad. Uh, Muhammad the prophet, they call him. Um, their religion is based upon his philosophies, uh, teachings and writings. Or you can go to uh, Hinduism and uh, based upon a human being. You can go to a, um, um, a Buddhism and uh, it's based upon the Buddha and so on. And you can trace it all to the, uh, the writings, the, the musings, the thoughts of the philosophies of a human being. The Christian religion is the only one that stands out as not being paced, placed, based upon a human philosophy. It's the only one that comes from a revelation, a revelation that is trustworthy, from outside of the human realm. And it is something that we treasure as Christians because Christians, genuine Christians, never claim that any one human being, whether it be Moses or Abraham or whoever, was the founder of the Christian church. The founder of the Christian church was Jesus himself who is God. God is the founder of the Christian church and uh, we proudly hold to that claim as Christians and uh, there is only one model for the Christian church and that is the model that Jesus set up back there in the beginning. The model for the Christian church of course started way back in the Garden of Eden but was more fully developed as time went on. But when we talk about the Christian church, we're talking more particularly about uh, the era from Jesus' time because Jesus set up something that was different from what had gone before. Not different in essence, but different in application. <coughs> and uh, in Matthew 16 and verse uh, 8, Jesus said that it would be upon him, I know this is a bit of a difficult text and much debated, but I'll use it, uh, Matthew 16 and verse 18, and it says, I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and Jesus is talking to Peter because Peter has just made a, a statement of uh, faith to say that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Peter has just made the statement of faith, an affirmation of faith and confidence in Jesus as the Son of God and hence the Saviour, the one in whom salvation is based. And Jesus says, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. You see, this is revealed. The, the, uh, the uh, foundational truth of the Christian faith has been revealed, and to, hear, to Peter, Jesus said, This has been revealed to you by my Father. And our confidence in the Christian faith, our confidence in the church, has to be revealed to us by the Father. 
If you read in the first uh, couple of chapters of the book of Acts, you will discover that it says there, and the Lord added unto the church daily such as should be saved. You notice it doesn't say that the disciples added to the church daily. It says the Lord added to the church daily. And how did the Lord add to the church daily? Well, he convicted people by revelation, the revelation through their conscience, through their mind, that what they were hearing about Jesus Christ was true and that he was the answer to the world's problem of sin and of death. And uh, it was revealed. And uh, Jesus commends Peter, and he goes on to say, I say unto you that you are Peter. Peter, you are this little rock. But upon this rock, and Jesus is now talking about himself, for he is um, alluding to all those scriptures in the Old Testaments that talk about Jesus, the Messiah, being the rock. Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it, or shall not succeed in destroying it. Jesus is saying that uh, the Lord, the God of creation, is the one who has revealed to us what the church is all about. You now, when we talk about a church, to most people today, they're, they're thinking about a place, a building. And I've had many people say uh, to me, where's your church? And uh, I like to give them the theological answer and say, our church is scattered throughout uh, 217 countries of the world. And if you want to go and see the Seventh-day Adventist church, take a trip across the world and you will find that there are Seventh-day Adventists in this country. And that one, no, no, 217, I think, at the moment. We work in out of 228 uh, nations uh, listed by United Nations, something like that. That's where the church really is, but most people want to know where your church building is. And uh, they want to drive past it, perhaps, and have a look to see if your church building um, is somewhat like the other church buildings in town. Does it look bigger and better? Is the car park fuller? And whatever. But the church that Jesus established had nothing to do with buildings. Indeed, the people had nowhere to meet except the upper room or perhaps in a synagogue if some of the Jewish congregation were amenable to their presence there. And uh, had nothing to do with buildings. The church that Jesus established was an organisation based upon the statement that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God. And all that is involved in that statement. This statement, of course, is only a very brief summary of what's involved in saying that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God. It is to say that Jesus is the promised Messiah. It is to say that Jesus is the life giver, that Jesus is the resurrector, that, uh, that Jesus is uh, the eternal God, that Jesus is the sacrifice for sin, and that Jesus is the one who makes atonement, and there's all these other things we can add into that pithy little statement that Peter put together and Peter had a pretty good brain he said thou art the Christ the son of the living God and uh, Jesus said God has revealed this to you the church the church model has to come from the revelation that God has given into the minds of people who would want to serve and follow him you don't have a church unless you have this revelation you can have people sitting in pews, but you don't have a church. And right across Christendom today, I would think you would find, and even in some Seventh-day Adventist congregations, a lot of people sitting in churches who really can't make a genuine claim to belong to the church. For they've never responded heartfeltly to the revelation that God has brought to their conscience that they... <coughs> owe to, to God and to Jesus Christ their life and their allegiance and their loyalty and uh, their love and appreciation for what he has done for them. In Acts chapter 2, <coughs> uh, <coughs> we read there that the church is, and we're talking really now about the characteristics of the church, the church is developed under the inspiration of initiated under Jesus Christ and developed under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 2, 
verses 21 and 22. <coughs> and uh, <coughs> the, uh, the uh, disciple is preaching here, you men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of, uh, of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst of you, as you yourselves also know, him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by wicked hands and have crucified and slain. <coughs> and uh, so the, uh, the apostle is emphasizing that this Jesus, whom they should have recognized, and he calls them ye men of Israel, you should have recognized this Jesus. He's the one who demonstrated who he was and what he was you should have known that uh, he is the Messiah and you've taken him and slain him and talks about him being raised up on the cross and the pains of death uh, he was not freed from and so on. You should have known that this Jesus would be the one who would institute uh, <coughs> and establish the church. Chapter 1 and uh, of uh, Acts, chapter 4 and uh, uh, verses 4 and 5, um, says, and being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem. Jesus is telling them this just before he goes back to heaven. And he says, but wait for the promise of the Father, which, Jesus said, you have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. And uh, Jesus promised them that if they waited... If they waited until God's appointed moment, the Holy Ghost would be sent to them and they would be baptized or enveloped with, as one is baptized and goes underwater and is enveloped in the water, you will be enveloped with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. And so Jesus links this waiting for the power that they would need to establish the church uh, with the Holy Ghost. And if you turn over to verse 8, it says, But you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. You see, this was to be the nucleus of the church. They were to wait and not commence their work until they knew that the Holy Ghost was there present with them. And one of the characteristics of the church is that the church knows that the Holy Ghost is with them. They know that the Holy Spirit is with them and the church doesn't move until they know the Holy Ghost is with them. And if the church moves and goes to do something without this assurance that the Holy Spirit is with them, then they are doing it on human initiative and not on the initiative of the Holy Spirit. Jesus initiated the church by telling his disciples to wait. And of course they did wait and they went to the upper room and there they waited uh, until the Holy Spirit came and that Pentecost came and that assurance was there because Jesus said it would happen and they knew that the Holy Spirit was there and now they knew they were to go about their mission and as you go on in the book of Acts there, you find that they were successful in telling the gospel story to those hundreds, thousands of people who were at Jerusalem at that time. <coughs> the church <coughs> would be a worldwide phenomena. One of the characteristics of the church would be that it would be a worldwide phenomena. This gospel will go to, of the kingdom will go to all the world, Jesus said, before the end comes. And <coughs> you find that in Matthew, of course. And, uh, <coughs> but Jesus says here that uh, you'll be witnesses both in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria. Now that was pretty local and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. The church would be a worldwide phenomena. And the only way that the church could be a worldwide phenomena was for it to be under the control of the Holy Spirit. A lot of uh, political groups have become established in the world over time. The Babylonians, the Egyptians and the Assyrians and uh, of course we know the, the Greeks and the Romans 
And uh, then, of course, uh, I suppose the British became pretty powerful. The, uh, the Spanish were pretty powerful. Uh, took on huge areas of the world, but none of them took the whole world. None of them went right across the world. Huge segments of the world were untouched by all of those powerful organisations. And uh, attempts have been made in the more recent times, if you go back 100 years, to uh, unite the world and uh, certainly big segments of the world and it hasn't worked. But what has gone further across the world than any other ideology, any other philosophy of life, it is the Christian church. It is the furthest and widest developed <coughs> ideology in the world today. Yes, there are big religions with millions, indeed billions, of supposed adherents, but they haven't spread across the world like Christianity has. So one of the characteristics of the church is that it's worldwide. Another of the characteristics of the church is that it is a social organisation. Christians are not hermits. You've probably read of uh, the uh, great hermit of the Eastern Orthodox Church who lived for 40 years on the top of a pole which uh, was 40 feet high from the ground. Uh, I presume it was a tree that had been cut off. He had a little platform up there. He lived there for 40 years and uh, he had a rope that he let down to the ground and his, uh, his followers and his adherents would uh, every day bring him some food and uh, a jug of water. And uh, there he stayed for 40 years. Is that a sign that it's a good health project? I don't know. He lived there in good weather and bad. Uh, in the heat and the sun, he had a little shade thing over the top of him. Uh, <clears throat> there, and he lived there because he wanted to attain purity. Jesus didn't say anything about the church being a bunch of hermits who live in their little perch here and there and never come together. Indeed, the very... Uh, first signs you see of the church being established is that there were people together. And you read in Acts there, the people were together. They were worshipping together, they were studying together, they were eating together, they were sharing together. The church is a social organisation. Why does it have to be a social organisation? Well, to be an evangelistic organisation, it must also be a social organisation because you can't evangelize unless you are associating with people. How many people came to see John, uh, John, his name was John somebody, I've just forgotten his name. Uh, it wasn't John Ross, no, he lived in a cave for a while. <laughs> Doug Batchelor, yeah. Um, no, John, uh, he lived in, uh, this was the year about 1460, he, there around he lived for 40 years in what uh, used to be Persia on top of his pole. How many people came to see him? Well, just some locals. A lot of people never knew he was there. The church is social. Acts chapter 2, 40 uh, onwards tells us of how social the church was. But the church was not an entertainment club. The church was never intended to be entertaining and to entertain people and tickle the fancies of their fickle minds the church was to be a social organisation so that people could learn from people. The church was also to be a service organisation. The church was to be an organisation to help people. And very early in the life of the church, we know that those seven deacons were chosen and uh, they were there to help people who were in need. The church was to be of service to the community in a very practical way. Acts chapter 20 and verse 35 said uh, <coughs> that uh, it is more blessed, the last uh, part of the verse, is more blessed to give than to receive. And that text says that it was the Lord who taught that concept. The Lord who taught that concept. It's more blessed to give than to receive. We are to be a service organisation if we want to claim to be a church. If you've done it unto one of the least, my brethren, Jesus says, you've done it unto me. 
church is to be a service organization. The church is to be evangelistic. The church was organized to be evangelistic. That's the reason that the church was really established and these other things have to come into it in order that we can be effective in evangelism. We are to be the purveyors of good news. I was walking down a street in London uh, some years ago and uh, this fellow had set up a sort of a, a stall thing there and uh, he was shouting out, I've got good news for everybody, I've got good news for everybody. And I thought to myself, this is one of those religious uh, groups that uh, you find now and again. And people were gathering around there and uh, when I got closer to there, because I was a bit curious and I was on holiday so it didn't matter, and uh, he was kept shouting out this about this good news. Um, he was dressed in, uh, yeah, probably the 1960s hippie sort of garb, and I thought, this is something a bit way out. But it ended up his good news was that he could sell you cameras for uh, around about three pounds, a camera for three pounds. However, in order to uh, get this camera for three pounds, you had to buy this and thus and so and whatever. And somebody is, I was with said, uh, that, that's an absolute bargain, he said. That's a bargain. It's the best news I've heard for years. I'm going to buy a camera for my daughter. At the end of the day, he spent 45, we worked out $45. At that time, it would have been about 30, 25 or 30 pounds, British pounds, uh, to buy a camera. And when he uh, got this camera and uh, studied it carefully, he discovered he could have bought it in New Zealand for $5. And so the good news was not such good news at all. He was a purveyor of junk. The church is to be a purveyor of good news. We are to sell the good news. The Bible talks about the gospel being bought and sold. And uh, we don't do it for a price. We do it because it has a value. We are to be purveyors of the good news. This gospel uh, is to go to all the world, Jesus said. This God spell a knowledge of the fact that God is with us is to go to all the world, Jesus says, and it will before the end comes. In Revelation 14, of course, we have that cry of that angel with a loud voice, the angel of evangelism, whom Seventh-day Adventists uh, believe is so significant for the world today. <clears throat> the angel which cries with a loud voice, proclaiming that we are to worship the God of creation, Worship the only being who is worthy of all our worship, all our allegiance, because he is a just God, because he is a God of judgment, a God who defines between what is right and what is wrong, and a God who knows who is safe to take to his kingdom and who is not. What does Jesus design to accomplish through his church? <coughs> the church is a life-giving stream. And I want to close with a passage from uh, an Old Testament book, the book of Ezekiel. I'm not going to ask how many people have read in the book of Ezekiel lately uh, because uh, it may be embarrassing. In fact, if you'd asked me a few days ago if I'd read in Ezekiel recently, I would have had to say, no, I haven't. But uh, I know there's a passage in Ezekiel that fits here and I'm going to close with that today. Ezekiel is chapter 47. <clears throat> you can follow it in whatever scripture you have. Ezekiel chapter 47. And uh, I'm reading from verse 8. <clears throat> then said he unto me, These waters issue out toward the east country, and they go down into the desert and go into the sea which being brought forth into the sea, the waters shall be healed. And it shall come to pass that everything that liveth, which moveth whithersoever the rivers shall come, shall live. And there shall be a great multitude, a very great multitude of fish, because these waters have come thither, for they shall be healed, and everything shall live whithersoever the water cometh. Now I wanted to go to verse 11. We'll leave out the little passage there. But the miry places thereof and the marshes thereof shall not be healed. They shall be given to salt. And by the river upon the bank thereof and on this side and on that side shall grow all trees for meat or for food whose leaf shall not fade. 
Neither shall the fruit thereof be consumed. Uh, fruit thereof. Um, sorry, I've lost child not faith. Neither shall the fruit thereof be consumed. In other words, you won't be able to eat it all. It shall bring forth new fruit according to his months, because their waters they issued out of the sanctuary, and the fruit thereof shall be for food, and the leaf thereof for medicine. Do you think of something in Revelation that is somewhat akin to this passage? And what is this passage talking about? This passage is talking about the results of a faithful church. The results of a faithful church will be like an abundance of water going into dry and arid areas. And it needs a lot more study than what I'm giving to it today. But even back in the time of Ezekiel, he was able to give a picture of a faithful church, those faithful people in Israel would be able to be like a stream of water, a huge flow of water that would be adequate to flood and irrigate the most arid pieces of territory in those countries. And uh, spiritually speaking, we're talking about the church being able to provide to the world that very necessary thing, the water of life. So that those people who are suffering from drought, spiritual drought, suffering from a lack of that refreshing water which is both uh, good for the soul and good for the body, providing food, spiritual food, something that is of eternal worth providing a healing balm. Of all the medicines that have ever been produced, the medical world still says that water is the best of the lot. The church is to be a healer in the world. It's to be the best thing that ever went to the world because the church is to be like the streams of living water that flows from the throne of God. Revelation talks about the water that flows from the throne of God. The church is here because it has been revealed to us by God himself. We belong to the church when we come to the realization that we need God and he needs us. When we come to the realization that we <coughs> would amount to nothing if it were not for what God has done. We would amount to nothing if it were not for Jesus Christ and his sacrifice on the cross. We would amount to nothing at all if it were not for the assurance that our sins can be forgiven and that we can be acceptable again to God. And we use that big word reconciliation, don't we? We can be acceptable again to God. And so as we consider the church, we've looked at the survey a little bit, and we might think to ourselves, maybe the church here is not the flowing stream that God could make it to be. Maybe God could make the stream flow a little broader, a little deeper, a little purer. Maybe with his help. In fact, I'll take that word back. We don't want a maybe in there, do we? With his help, we can be a stream of water going out into a dry and dusty desert and bringing people the health that they need in order to take their place in Jesus' kingdom. Let's uh, close with our closing hymn, shall we? It... Uh it's number 359, if you're using your hymn book, 359. Hark the voice of Jesus calling. Father, we are thankful that you have organised the church in such a way that it can represent you in a world that has turned so largely against you. We pray that this church will be one that represents you. We pray that we will recognise where our shortcomings are, that we will establish more fully our strengths we pray that your spirit will guide and lead this church and you will reveal to us as you have revealed to so many others what you would have us to do and so dismiss us today we pray with the assurance 
that we find our salvation in Jesus and may we each one today be reaffirmed in the faith that we hold to. We ask please in Jesus' name. Amen.